<laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming this morning. Um, uh, this is the uh, the first uh, Zim2 with Zoom call that we've done that's more about Zim2, but uh, um, that should make it somewhat interesting. Uh, and we've got a full schedule of, uh, of presenters from the individual companies. But let me just go over the format to start with. Um, we like this uh, this beginning part where people are bantering back and forth. Uh, uh, nice to see that participation. Uh, at this point, we're going to uh, uh, automatically mute everybody's uh, 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 computer. Um, but if you would like to speak, or when it's uh, if you're one of the speakers, uh, you need to go to the bottom of the screen and unmute yourself. Um, um, so just to get started, uh, um, in general, um, um, Zim2 has been going through some uh, interesting and evolving times. Um, and certainly um, this initiative uh, of, of the Zoom calls is part of Zim2's answer uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and uh, in order to uh, offer our shareholder base uh, and the shareholder base of the companies we're involved with. Um, we are stepping up our game and the whole digital marketing and, uh, and, and video conferencing area. Uh, and uh, uh, to that extent, uh, we have uh, a new hire on the Zim2 team. Um, or I like to maybe refer to him as a draft choice. <laughs> uh, his name is Colton Griffin, and uh, he's here at the table with us. Uh, just say hello, Colton, so that... Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can quite see me yet, but there I am. Uh, nice to meet everybody. So, um, um, as most of you uh, probably already know, Zim2 has a variety of business plans that it, uh, it uses in an effort to increase shareholder value. Um, and first of all, um, um, our company creation aspect of what Zim2 does and sort of is really where Zim2 started uh, on creating companies on what at that time was called the CNQ. Um, but at one point we were 10% of that whole exchange in terms of the number of listings we had created. Um, the, uh, um, uh, and that, that part of the business uh, continues. It's uh, evolved a little bit, a bit uh, in, in not quite so much volume of company creation but more of quality. And uh, you'll hear from a couple of, uh, of those co recent companies um, in, in the presentations, and that would be Core Assets, uh, our newest uh, listing, and, uh, and Dimension 5, um, and the rebirth of Dimension 5 into something really quite exciting, which, uh, which Chris Parr is here to tell you about. Um, the uh, one of the historic ways that Zim2 has uh, um, uh, applied its business model to is the uh, prospecting or the uh, prospect uh, uh, generator. Um, um, essentially, we were quite involved in staking properties uh, uh, with a partner usually. Um, and then marketing them to other TSX Venture uh, or CSE juniors. Um, and that uh, in its day was extremely profitable. Um, however, the market has cooled to the extent that uh, um, um, there's not as much uh, uh, low hanging fruit, so to speak, uh, in that area. Although we're still somewhat active. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, the, the sort of the focus 
uh, with Zim2 at the moment uh, is to uh, uh, carry on with the company creation aspect, uh, however, focus a little bit more on quality. And I think when you see uh, uh, what we've done with both Core and now with Dimension 5, um, uh, and the, the fact that we have a large share position, I think that will help you to understand. But maybe we'll, uh, we'll move on in the agenda um, uh, and introduce some of the companies that Zim2 has an interest in. And uh, in spite of what you might have been told about who is going first and who is going last, um, 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 we have a slight uh, request to change the, uh, the uh, order of things, and, and that came from uh, 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 Princess Ron McDonald. Um, <laughs> And he wanted to be moved up in the agenda uh, uh, because he's such a busy man. Um, so we'll have those, uh, those eight short presentations and then that will be followed by a joint question and answer period. Um, um, however, if, uh, if you'd like to ask a question in the middle of things, just unmute yourself and uh, we'll try to provide that opportunity. Um, so first of all, uh, um, a company that uh, I'm quite excited about, uh, Zim2 is quite excited about, uh, uh, and uh, I happen to also be a director of the company, um, and, it's, uh, and that's Zinc8. And here to tell us a little bit about it, uh, is Ron McDonald. We did have a uh, dedicated uh, Zoom meeting for Zinc8, which was well attended um, and a very successful uh, presentation. Um, and I expect that we'll be doing that again for Zinc8 in the near future. But with his uh, uh, four minutes uh, elevator pitch, Ron McDonald. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Supreme Commander, uh, for that intro. Um, and just to let you know, the reason I asked that, because I want to, I, I, I love all these companies that are going to be presenting, is that I'm going to join a call late uh, with a company in Hyderabad that we've got some extensive dealings with. So it's already started, but the other guys can handle that. So look, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks, Zim2, for inviting us today. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole company, but I will give a little bit of an update about who we are. And uh, so we're, we are a newer entrant into the marketplace. We went public, I think, last July. Company has been around though for about 12 years, but in various guises and in various levels of interface with the market. What does that mean? Well, the most recent iteration was with Tech Resources, which is the largest zinc miner in the world. And Tech bought a number of uh, patents from a company down in Silicon Valley that many years ago put a lot of money in to try to scale up zinc air batteries and they were not successful. Uh, when Tech took them over, uh, the team, most of whom I still have, that was, that was a number of years back, five, seven years back, um, tried to rethink the whole uh, zinc air approach. Uh, the dendrite uh, production in, in most attempts at zinc air batteries to scale up uh, stopped everybody. We took a different look at it, my team did, and said, we're gonna make dendrites our friends. And so they come up with uh, various new technologies. We have 20 patents uh, around various parts of our technology. We've got four pending and three being written. So what do I want to tell you? Well, um, I was been in the business for quite a long time. I didn't know about the zinc air battery. I didn't know about it because it was ap operating behind the curtain for five years over at tech. So there was no interface with the market. It was purely a lab and a technology play. Uh, tech then decided when they figured out that the new system didn't consume zinc. You put zinc in once, that was it for 20 years. So they said, whoa, what are we developing here? It's a, it's, it's a gas tank that you fill up and it goes almost in perpetuity, at least 20 years. So they decided to shut it down. It was picked up by another company and then uh, we took it uh, public last July. Uh, we have been getting accolades globally. Uh, this is a technology that uh, nobody knew really existed at this pre-commercialized stage. Um, We've won a couple of major awards which validate the technology. Uh, NIPA, largest uh, power, public power utility in the United States, 
um, had a competition, 102 companies from all over the world. Uh, 60 were qualified, we won the competition. We're building out a 100 kilowatt, one megawatt uh, system, 10 hour system for them um, and it will be installed sometime in 2022. We also want another challenge from NIPA. Again, lots of big companies and we've partnered with Digital Energy, a company that is a private company. It's got over 100 CHP applications. And on those CHP applications, this is a pipeline for us, just like NIPA has over 100 projects. So we've uh, contracted with them. We won that contest and we'll be announcing shortly where the battery will be installed. Give you a hint, it's down in Brooklyn. Uh, the other battery for NIPA, the first one, will be installed at a, uh, a State University of New York facility in upstate New York. That will be announced shortly as well. We also have a project that is being built out right now uh, in our back lot in our labs down in Ash Street in Vancouver. It will be our first installation. It's in a very special architecturally uh, renowned home that is being constructed in South Surrey, and it is a 40 kilowatt system. And so that is our first, what I would call a major installation and proof of uh, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the technology. So where are we at? Look, we've been so busy. Once we won these two, um, once we won these two uh, uh, contests, it basically meant for a lot of other big utilities and big EPC and, and solar and wind developers that we were pre-qualified because NIPA is the most progressive <laughs> and it's the largest uh, utility in, in the United States. New York State is a major uh, uh, lead uh, almost globally in, in moving over to 100% renewable generation. And so it sent a lot of messages out that we need to look at this technology. Keep in mind, it was all done behind the curtain for five years. So uh, we continued through COVID. We didn't lay anybody off. We come up with a system where they were working mostly from home. We had to revamp uh, all the offices like most of us have had to do. Uh, I hired seven new people during COVID to advance this along. Um, we have uh, we have a production target to go into full commercial production 2023. We've enacted, uh, enacted a couple of changes, uh, uh, which hopefully will shave at least six months off of that. And that's important because in our first year, we expect to make about 40 to $60 million in revenue. So it's important to try to get that revenue stream in. Um, we are in discussions globally. This is a global product. This is not a regional product. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to the United States because New York has such promise and they've given us credibility. And uh, so our first facility will probably be in that state. Um, and we are in active negotiations with uh, New York Empire State Development on that. Uh, but just uh, to, and Dave, tell me when my time is up within 30 seconds. Uh, I think, we well, are, you're okay with time. Okay, <laughs> but just, here's what I'm going to say. We are, we are in a somewhat advanced discussions uh, in Australia, Middle East, Europe, and USA, Canada, with companies that you would, and most of the companies you would see as global brands. Um, and uh, let's see where they go. Uh, two things, going to rock everybody's world, number one, September 22nd, Battery Day, Pat Power. Battery yep. Day. And that Battery Day. World. Yeah, that's it. It's anticipated that, uh, that uh, Musk will be announcing uh, a 600-mile battery, changes the world. And we expect um, uh, Chuck Schumer, who is the Democrat leader in the Senate, uh, he hasn't come out with this publicly, but we are aware of it. Uh, four, uh, four of his major announcements, if they do take the Senate and the White House. The fourth one is that all combustion engines will have to be off the road in the United States by 2040. Those two things take what is an emerging and large market into an exponentially uh, larger development just with those two announcements. So that's who we are. We just closed the financing. It was oversubscribed by two times, uh, which is great news out in this market. And we'll be going to the market for more uh, as, we, as we go forward. That's it, Dave. Thanks very much, Ron. Uh, um, I don't think uh, you should underestimate the importance of, uh, of Ron mentoring, mentioning Battery Day, uh, because as the conversion from uh, uh, gasoline engines to electric uh, vehicles uh, gain speed, it's going to put incredible pressure on the grid all over the world. The electrical grid can't replace all of the gas stations. So the savior, the world savior for the, the electrical grid globally is the cake. <laughs> Just keep that in mind when you call your broker. 
And uh, at this point, if I could introduce uh, uh, Mr. Pat Power, um, and uh, he has a little bit of a, of a tough task ahead of him here as the uh, diamond sector, uh, diamond exploration sector is uh, not exactly on a tear. However, the, uh, the opportunity is reflected in the stock price um, and the opportunity at the moment is to buy when the rest of the market is not paying attention to diamond exploration. And I think after you hear Pat and what, and what Arctic Star has got, uh, you'll be able to see that it is uh, uh, the turnaround company uh, when we get a little bit more life in, in the diamond exploration world. Anyway, Pat, I won't tell the whole story for you. Uh, oh, yeah. I just <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Okay, thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks Zim too for inviting us. Um, I've worked with Dave for uh, many, many years. He's a really good friend, and he's uh, been a big supporter with Zim too for Arctic for as long as Arctic's been around, which has been 2002. So we're a very dedicated diamond company. Um, we have put together a team of people, uh, primarily led by Buddy Doyle, who's ex Rio Tinto. And Buddy, uh, he's our vice president as well as the director. He was the person in charge of Rio Tinto's program up in Lac de Gras when they found Divic. So he has an, a, a, an immense background in uh, diamonds and in success with diamonds. Uh, we have two primary projects that we've developed over the last four or five years. Uh, we've had access to these projects because, as Dave was saying, the diamond market's been a bit tough and we don't really have any competitors anymore. So Buddy's been able to run free with his ideas around the planet. And the two projects that have really developed out of that are one in Finland. Um, and Finland is a great jurisdiction, as we know. Um, it's also part of the Karelian Kraton, which is connected to Russia and Russia's diamond mines and very well underexplored for diamonds. So we've had a lot of success in the last three years there. We've discovered five pipes, uh, all diamond difference, all really nice diamonds. Uh, work continues there. It's got great infrastructure. We stay in hotels. We don't even have a camp. Uh, so that's progressing very, very well. And that will be progressing in the next uh, two to three months with Fusion on our last two discoveries there. So we'll have diamond results out of that very shortly. Uh, one of the big ones, though, in our, in our main project is a, it's a project in Canada called Diagra, and it's connected to the Lac de Gras. It's right, be right beside the two existing mines, uh, Diavik and Akadi. Uh, Diavik being discovered by Buddy and Rio Tinto back in the day. Uh, it's right on the, it's right in the quarter of Hope, which all the producing pipes out of those two projects are producing from. So we're right, geology-wise, we're right in the right spot. Uh, we picked up a big piece of ground that the beers used to have, and they discovered 21 pipes on it, all mag lows, and it's, we don't have enough time to go into that geophysical theory, but overall, Buddy has a theory that mag low pipes don't contain the best kind of diamonds in the world. So we've done geophysics over all the 21 pipes. We've got some fantastic targets that we believe are Kimberlites, and there's a really high probability that we're going to come up with way better results than the mag low. Uh, discoveries that were done in the mid 90s. Uh, that's worked for Gaucho, that was exactly what they did. They took two De Beers pipes, they did gravity over them, they found two extensions, and they have a mine now. Uh, Buddy did it with 20 of his pipes back in 98 uh, for Divic, all mag lows, did geophysics over them, gravity and EM, and found seven new pipes. All of them had better results than the existing mag low pipes. Um, so we're looking very much forward to that. That's going to occur in late March, April, May, and June. That's our, that's our window up on Lock Gras that we can get in there. We were kind of shut out this year because of COVID-19. They wouldn't allow us to have a camp. In fact, they wouldn't allow us to get near Yellowknife. Um, I always thought it was because Buddy's bad breath, but apparently it was COVID-19. Uh, so this year is our year to get back in there, and we will be raising money in the next four or five months for that program. It will run between 1.5 and $2 million, but it will bring 15 drill holes into 15 Kimberlites, we hope. But just hold your breath after that because the results could be dynamic. And as Dave said, it's a tough diamond market, but the market's getting better. Diamonds were particularly hurt badly because uh, diamonds, they depend on retail sales and all the stores closed. So all the producers' profits plummeted to pretty well zero. That's all coming back now. Uh, and we have very little competition. So it's a, you know, the stock is reflecting that. It's, it's trading at minimal values right now, but it, uh, we believe we have the two best exploration projects on the planet. 
and we believe we have the management to take those through to uh, success. And I think what you meant was it's trading at the uh, opportunity value. Yeah, that's the other thing I could have said. <laughs> you'll see it, it's a very large opportunity on the upside. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's downside. It is. And then, you know, as we know, if everyone's been in the market before, there's, it's cyclical and it comes back and there is opportunity, there's peaks and valleys, and this is one of the big valleys. <laughs> so we're looking forward to one of the peaks very shortly. Anyway, thank you, Pat. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention that I intended on mentioning uh, after each of the, or before each of the presenters, was the stock position and warrant position that uh, Zim2 may ho hold in that company. Uh, and with Zincate, uh, Zim2 holds uh, 8.1 million uh, uh, shares of, of, of Zincate and 3.7 million warrants uh, at, uh, at 12 cents. Uh, so we have a very large position. Uh, we're very supportive of the company. Um, in Arctic Star, uh, the one that Pat just reported on, um, we have a, a, a very significant position in terms of number of shares, uh, and we own um, uh, we own eleven and a half million shares of Arctic Star, and uh, and five million warrants uh, at an exercise price of fifteen, which is a little bit out of the money. Uh, but uh, we do have that large share position for, for when Pat and Buddy make the big discovery. Next uh, um, on the schedule is uh, a, uh, uh, a near-term uh, producer um, uh, of a commodity that uh, we have uh, a total of three companies that are involved with that commodity. The other two companies are early stage exploration in terms of that uh, uh, of the commodity, and that would be uh, fluoride or fluorspar. Um, um, uh, but let me introduce first uh, James Walker, uh, and he's got the company they're about to turn the mine on. Uh, James. Oh, thanks, David. Um... So yeah, my name is James Walker. I, I'm the CEO of Aerie Strategic Mining. Um, the, the idea behind the company didn't begin as floor spar. It began because I had a vehicle and I was looking for any project that was near to production, was permitted, and I could just get a cash flow out of this. And, um, I went through a couple hundred projects and I actually, I didn't know anything about floor spar, but I dug this one up. It was operating down in Utah. Um, so I went down there and I took a geologist who was an expert on floor spar and we found um, floor spar pipes all over this, all over this property um, before we even visited the mine. So we staked the entire mountain range and then we bought out the mine itself um, after we'd done all our due diligence and testing because um, they were just, I'd never seen a mining operation like it. They were just taking the stuff out of the wall and putting it in a bag and they were selling it to the steel mills. And I thought with a little bit of flotation upgrading, you could, um, and, and a bit more of an industrial uh, uh, mining base. You could turn a few tons a week into a few thousand tons a month um, and create a massive, massive business. And uh, the more I explored into it, the better the business got because it turned out that um, there's no producers of floor spa in the United States. This is the only permitted and producing mine. Um, and if you don't know much about floor spa, it's, it's used as flux in steel, um, it goes into aluminium, uh, refrigeration units, lithium-ion batteries. If you've ever wondered on your smartphones why you can put your finger down the, the screen and not have a grease mark like on a window, that's floor spar in that. Um, uh, hydrofluoric acid, fluorine, uh, medical equipment, asthma inhalers. It, it, it's quite a ubiquitous uh, uh, mineral used in the industry. So um, yeah, so we bought this mine and I, I vented it into uh, my empty vehicle. I went out onto the market and I raised a couple million dollars um, to, to get started, which I used for drilling, metallurgy, process plant design, equipment selection, um, to bring in some mining engineers and I put them all to work designing a mine plan um, uh, to get everything ready. So we proved up that we can produce acid spar, which is the highest grade. 
of, um, of floor spar in the industry, uh, which goes into things like aluminium and refrigeration units and hydrofluoric acid. Um, we worked out that the, the margin it would cost us to produce one ton would be about $100, but we could sell it for $500 a ton. So the margin of it was brilliant. Um, we had some permitters go through all the existing permits and update everything. So um, at the moment, we're just uh, we're collecting up all the information to put into a mine plan. Um, but once that's done, which will be in about six weeks' time, then we just start construction on the mine. And the longest lead item on that is the plant itself, which will take about five months from ordering to commissioning. Um, so we're looking at quarter one, Q1, 2020 to go, 2021 to go back into production, producing predominantly uh, acid spa for industry. So um, as soon as we announced we had this mine, um, we were approached by groups like Thyssen Krupp and Parcellas Contour for offtake agreements. Um, uh, we sent them bulk samples and they did their own analyses and then offered us a contract based on that. Um, when I brought the mining engineers in, <clears throat> they had a look at the economics of this and they said, you know, um, if, you, if you're looking at a long-term strategy for the company, um, it'd be a very good idea to invest in um, your own hydrofluoric acid facility, which would take your revenues from, um, say, $30, $30 million a year to $150 million a year. Um, so uh, they've, uh, they're putting us in contact with some of their guys who have built chemical plants in the past. So short term is going to be getting into production with Acid Spa. Um, supplying industry with that for 2021 and 2022 and um, and then uh, getting in hopefully putting in our own hydrofluoric acid facility as well uh, while we sell acid spa to industry and um, on top of that while we were building all this up we found one of the largest uh, um, floor spa deposits in in Canada so um, and that was over on the west coast near actually in British Columbia and we bought that out 100 percent as um, uh, as a long-term prospect to develop that in tandem, just so we can we can dominate the North American trade um, and keep the monopoly, hopefully, on North American uh, on floor spa. So, I think that, I think that's everything. James, uh, a world dominance is important, right. and uh, <laughs> and certainly we wish you the best in world dominance of floor spa. Um, I should have mentioned that. Uh, Aries was is fairly new to Zim2, um, and uh, we were able to do some favors for them uh, uh, in terms of digging up historic information. Um, and uh, we currently have um, um, I can't I can't remember either, David. Um, I think three million shares. I think no, 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 not that many. Uh, um, Aries. It's over a million. Yeah, it would be over. Definitely. All right, maybe, yeah. Plus the warrants. Um. Oh, yes, yes. So we own uh, 1,250,000 shares uh, and 625,000 warrants uh, at 15 cents. Uh, so I think that's uh, that, those are in the money, aren't they? Those are in the money now. Yeah, you can you can cash them whenever you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At this point, uh, James would get most of the money. However, yeah. uh, <laughs> so we'll wait a bit on those. Um, the uh, uh, next uh, uh, company up uh, is our longtime uh, um, uh, company, uh, Commerce Resources. Commerce was the first company that Zim2 created, um, and that was uh, some years ago. We currently hold uh, 6.2 million shares of Commerce and uh, 5 million warrants at an exercise price of 35 cents. So almost in the money, Grove. Almost in the money, Hodge, almost. <laughs> And uh, so this is Chris Grove. He's the president of Commerce Resources. Um, and he's going to um, tell us a little bit about that company. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to speak to you all today. And, uh, and certainly uh, from what uh, Ron McDonald said and what Dave said as well, uh, the world is transitioning from fossil fuels over to a green 
uh, uh, technology, uh, the uh, electric uh, grid, uh, the electrification of transportation, there's no question about that. Certainly, uh, we would arguably not have Saudi Aramco public if that were not the case. And uh, certainly their public statements of peak oil being at 2035 uh, seem somewhat uh, uh, conservative. And I would suggest that inside the boardroom of Saudi Aramco, they're probably thinking 2024 or 2025 is actually peak oil. But at any rate, uh, besides the ma that macro, which is a hugely important macro, there's another macro that's going on right now. And that is essentially that everyone on planet Earth who is not Chinese is looking to reduce or eliminate their dependency on China as a supplier. And if anything, uh, COVID-19 has uh, underscored that, underlined that, exacerbated those feelings. And so, you know, from uh, uh, industry and from governments everywhere outside of China, uh, this is a major trend. In terms of the commodities we're working on, uh, this is also a major factor. As uh, James Walker uh, said so compellingly and uh, profoundly about fluorospar, China historically has been the world's largest fluorospar exporter. China is now a fluorospar importer and it is also an importer of rare earth elements. It's been an importer of rare earth elements on balance for about two years now, or at least two years as reported by the Chinese services that uh, service that we subscribe to out of, uh, out of Beijing called Buy Info, which is cheap as borscht. And uh, so I highly recommend Buy Info for like $1,500 US per year per subscription. At any rate, these are two very significant macros. So China is a net importer of both rare earth elements and fluorospar. In terms of rare earth element prices, uh, this change in the global dynamic has not been as significant as it has been in fluorospar. Fluorospar's prices have trebled, tripled in the last uh, uh, three to four years. And I can't find a more recent price chart, but I believe the trajectory is the same, that prices continue to rise. Now, having said that, for our ashram deposit, uh, fluorospar is a byproduct, but because of the style of deposit that the ashram is, which is a carbonatite, think about it as a huge blob that goes from surface all the way down to the center of the earth, we have only scratched the surface on this deposit and we have proven up a defined resource at this point of 249 million tons in total. Of course, I should break that down into measured, uh, indicated and inferred. Uh, and I'm happy to do that. It is, uh, anyways, it's about 219 million tons in the inferred category, and the rest is in the indicated and measured category. At any rate, we've also added 10,000 meters of drilling to that deposit, so it will get a little bit larger as well. Now, having said that, uh, 249 million tons in total at, about, at approximately 2% of rare earth elements, uh, that 249 million tons is also uh, has an average of 7% fluorospar. So that is a gargantuan fluorospar resource. Uh, we believe it is the second largest fluorospar resource on planet Earth defined at this point in time, second only to, strangely, the world's largest rare earth element producer, which is Bayanobo in China, which is also the dominant rare earth element producer. So one of the things that is commerce's uh, goal, and it has been our goal all the way along, is to be competitive with China on cost of production of rare earth elements. In terms of the current industry interest in commerce resources for both of our commodities, we are receiving, I would say, increased interest in both the rare earth elements and the fluorospar. I had a very pleasant uh, call with Tokyo last night, 6 p.m. here in Vancouver time, 10 a.m. Thursday in Tokyo with one of the companies that Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, just invested into, and they did bring that up. And I said, well, maybe you can get a deal at uh, Dairy Queen now, or Dairy Queen will open up in Tokyo. But at any rate, 
uh, this trading company has expressed an interest in our uh, both commodities, but with a primary interest in the Fleurus bar. So I do expect an NDA from them shortly, and uh, we'll see where that happens to go. In terms of another company that I had a very long and substantive uh, phone call with, uh, BASF, I spoke to their new global procurement manager recently, and I have to say that uh, in general, the German companies seem to be some of the most uh, anxious in terms of uh, reducing or eliminating their dependency on China. And I'm talking Krupp, Siemens, uh, um, uh, some companies I can't talk about because they're under NDA, but uh, Oyer Remy, Tribacher, Tribacher of course is Austrian, but uh, these companies are very concerned about future supply. And of course, as you know, uh, in general, the European Union is ahead of the game in terms of North America, in terms of transitioning over to electric vehicles. So at this point in time, I would like to say that I had a, a very good phone call yesterday with Nick Hazen, and uh, we are seeing uh, significant improvements on the impurity suppression of our Fluorospar uh, uh, product that we uh, are looking then to deliver to industry as requested. Uh, in terms of that, uh, I think I'm probably near the end of my time, aren't I, Dave Hodge? Uh, yeah, I would suggest you are. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity. And at this time, if I can, I would like to introduce my very uh, uh, trusted associate, Justin Schrun, Herr Schrun, uh, just behind the Supreme Commander there. And uh, certainly Justin has been doing an excellent job over the last uh, a month uh, when yours truly has been not as uh, much in the office. And uh, certainly Justin <laughs> and I would be happy to talk to you uh, and update you in more detail uh, at any time. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. So on that point, um, um, in all likelihood, most of the companies that you're hearing about today uh, will have their own Zoom calls sometime in the near future. Um, and so make sure that you have uh, emailed Michael Patience uh, so that you'll be on the invite list. Um, and those uh, Zoom meetings with just one company uh, go into a lot more detail um, and usually uh, have more than one speaker. Uh, at this point, uh, um, I should probably introduce uh, our, um, our, our analyst, uh, uh, Stefan Bogner, writes under the name Rockstone Research. Uh, of course, uh, he's out of the Zurich area, uh, and um, he will uh, uh, welcome any of our uh, German-speaking uh, 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 participants uh, and maybe tell us a little bit in English about Rockstone. Yes, hello everybody and uh, many greetings from Switzerland and uh, I, as you probably know I've been covering a lot of these companies who are presenting here right now. I've covered it with the Rockstone Research Newsletter and uh, it's a cost-free newsletter everybody should subscribe to because whenever these companies have some major news I, 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 I tend to write a report on them and uh, put my own perspective in it and uh, the reports are available in English and in German, and I publish it on several websites in Germany and in, in North America. And yes, uh, we also have a couple of German friends here, which I would like to uh, welcome. Achtung, Achtung, hallo alle deutschen uh, Zuhörer. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ihr heute da seid. Und sollten Sie am Ende der, der Präsentation dieser Unternehmen irgendwelche Fragen haben, dann können Sie diese auch gerne in Deutsch stellen, dann übersetze ich die auf Englisch und äh, Sie können natürlich auch auf Englisch stellen die Fragen, wenn Sie es wollen und ja, das wäre es von meiner Seite gewesen, viel Spaß und äh, bis bald. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Stefan, there was a question that came up on the messaging that was in German. Yes, Helmut, Helmut is, I think he's, uh, he's on holiday right now, he's from Germany and uh, I believe he sent in some questions to you. So just forward me the questions so I can see them. Is that Helmut? Was it someone else? Yeah, it's Helmut. Is yeah. it? Somebody, yeah. Well, it's somebody it? talking about Helmut. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, we'll deal with that in due course. Um, and uh, the uh, next company I'd like to introduce uh, is uh, 
our latest company creation, uh, uh, and it was uh, based on a copper gold silver property uh, in northern British Columbia. And at that time, uh, Nick Rodway was working for uh, Zim2, and he's a geo, and these two prospectors came into my office. And it was about two weeks before Christmas. And uh, they were trying to sell, sell us this gold, silver property in northern British Columbia. And uh, I figured out uh, through the conversation that what they were really looking for was turkey dinner. Uh, so uh, we, made, we made them uh, an offer uh, that would only be accepted if you were hungry. Um, and uh, um, we then uh, went on to, uh, to do some exploration on it uh, uh, through both Nick and uh, Drew's geological. Uh, the results uh, suggested that we should take this company public uh, as uh, part of the Zim2 family. Uh, and uh, we uh, have basically appointed uh, um, Scott Rose uh, to lead that charge. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Nick was also on that team as he was one of the, the people that uh, were involved in the decision to purchase the property. Anyways, at this point, if I could introduce uh, Scott Rose. Thanks, Dave, and thanks for all of you attending. Uh, as you know, my name is Scott Rose. I'm a founder and director, along with Dave Hodge, Nick Broadway, and Zim2 Capital. Uh, it was formed, CORE was formed around a property called The Blue, uh, 48 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. To date, we have raised approximately $600,000 and we have uh, around 169 shareholders and we're recently listed on the CSC and the symbol is CC. Uh, the company's main focus is the Blue Project, which I'm going to let Nick talk about, and the newly acquired ground that we recently announced. And maybe I could let Nick have the floor here. Uh, yeah, so uh, like you were saying, it was a good opportunity at a good time. Um, I thought it was a good acquisition, uh, mostly for geological reasons. Um, so the, the market cap, as you said, the company right now is just over $4 million. I think it's traded 19 cents today, uh, 21 million shares out. Um, so the whole idea of this property um, was actually based upon, at the time we were looking at scar mineralization and the association of cobalt with that. Um, I've since uh, figured out that it's actually more porphyry copper situation and potentially uh, CRD, carbonate replacement type uh, deposit. So we've kind of, uh, we've, we've been going on a kind of a new um, a look at this thing through a golden triangle idea. Now, I'm not sure who, what you know about the history of golden triangle, but basically all started the 1800s with the Klondike gold rush. And it, you know, went all the way up to Atlin. Atlin's a very uh, prolific placer mining area. So there's been a lot of gold mine out of that area in the past. And now what we know is the Golden Triangle is basically the premier gold mine um, all the way up to the Escape Creek and Stikine area. And now the kind of the joke is, you know, it, it, the Golden Triangle is basically from the Premier Mine to wherever your project is located. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so anyway, so but the, really this whole thing is a geological story, you know, it put, put a park the promo side on the on the triangle and any polygon you can come up with, whether it be the Golden Horseshoe or anything. But this project does have all the ingredients that you'd look to for a porphyry, district scale size porphyry style deposit. And I mean, I think it shows really good promise. And right now, it's basically a lot of desktop study work. Uh, we've, we've had this project already fully permitted for drilling uh, when it was under the Zim2 name. And since it's been transferred over, and I've doubled the amount of drilling to 20 holes from 10 to 20. Um, also permitting for, I want to I look more into the secondary and tertiary structures in the area that that splay out of what's called the Llewellyn Fault Zone. And the Llewellyn Fault Zone actually runs all the way from North Atlanta Lake all the way down through these well-known districts, you know, the KSM, Premier, 
Cascade Creek, all these areas. You know, they're all they all have the same ingredients um, that come to play for Port Breeze. You know, it's a large regional fault system that's uh, mobilizing fluid, and we're lucky enough to have uh, superficial exposure um, that has massive sulfide. And there is one drill hole on property that Tech did back in the 1980s, and it was there was 175 meters of 0.29 copper from surface. So that hole was just left. It was it was of no interest at that time due to uh, the prices of copper, and the gold was actually not even assayed for. So some of the surface samples I've taken have indicated that there is, you know, there's, I've had as high as uh, four grams gold, low as 0.2. Branch, so that's pretty indicative of pork breed type of uh, environment. We also have super gene alteration in the granitoids in the area. Um, and uh, like I said, there are these scarms that are at that surface with you know, 8%, 9% copper. So the idea here is to look at these uh, secondary tertiary structures through magnetics, uh, get a few more layers into the database, and uh, you know, further delineate the drills. Well, that's basically the gist to the story. Thank you, Nick. All right. Um, uh, so that's uh, Core Assets Corp, uh, CC on the, on the CSE. Um, and Zim2 holds uh, 7.2 million shares of, of Core. Uh, and you can see as you start to add up all these different shareholder bases uh, that, that Zim2 owns uh, and uh, and uh, there is 16 million shares of, of, of Zim2 in existence. You can see that if, uh, if we have one, two, or three winners uh, out of this group, um, it's going to have a very dramatic effect on Zim2. The next company uh, uh, is, uh, is one that uh, I, I've always been particularly fond of it. <laughs> Um, because my description uh, of what they do is and what they're going to accomplish uh, will save the turtles globally. Long after I'm gone, you'll be able to say you knew the guy that helped save the turtles. And that's really the driving point behind this story. And, uh, and I'll leave it at that and, and let Chris Parr explain uh, just how uh, Dimension 5 and, and their acquisition of Enduro Energy is going to accomplish that and all the way along make you money, well, providing you've made the right decision at this point. Chris Parr. Hey, Chris, you're muted. You muted, Chris. There. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I will talk a little bit about Adiro Energy. I think most people on this call are quite familiar with how we're going to save the world's turtles. And it is more than just saving the, the turtles. Really, there's three um, hydrocarbon upgrading technologies that they call hydrochemolytics, which is a water chemical based um, fully patented technology, something that's completely revolutionary and new to the industry that um, upgrades plastics, heavy oil and renewable oils. So they have uh, individual technologies to solve those three areas, which all three of them are extremely large. The focus is in the plastic space and you know you look at you look at plastics and and um, how much of an issue it is how plastics pollution um, and production is just it's growing exponentially right now it, it, it's just and now with covid and and masks and single use plastics and you know one third of of all of all plastics ends up um, you know, as land or marine pollution. And like, so why is that, you ask? I mean, there's really no solution out there in existence that, that can handle all of the, the plastics and, and waste that we're producing. Um, it's, it's especially a major issue in, 
in the global markets, you look, you look at throughout Asia and, and developing countries, it just, they don't have the infrastructure to, to handle all the plastic waste. And, you know, the current technologies like pyrolysis, where essentially they just burn the plastics, they heat it up, they extract energy out of it. These are technologies that were created in the, you know, the 1900s. They've been around, you know, for centuries and, and it's just, it's, it's just that needs to change. And so Enduro, they've been developing a technology for the past seven plus years now um, through, through many partners, they've worked with uh, Greenfield Global, a uh, billion dollar plus uh, company, uh, developing this technology. Um, like I said, it's completely patented. It's uh, water-based, uh, chemical, low temperature technology that, um, you know, we, we really believe that it's, it's scalable and it will be a solution that can handle this massive plastic problem. Um, but at the same time, you look at the, the heavy oil issue in, in Alberta with the price of oil, um, you know, and the upgrading of, of hydrocarbons. Um, you know, the technology basically eliminates the need for use of hydrogen and, and blending for, for heavy oil, which is really big for Alberta. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really a revolutionary thing that um, we're very excited to take to market. The company is working right now on their showroom pilot plant, which is on track. We've just closed the uh, financing and we've, uh, so we're going through the process of getting this transaction done. We've got the audit started. Uh, so that's, that's on track, ready to, to get completed. And uh, the definitive agreement, like Ofer is flying right now uh, from Toronto. So we're sitting down to, to uh, hopefully sign that very soon. And we're going to have a lot of uh, other, other news while Aduro is, is working on their uh, showroom plant. So very exciting times for, for Aduro. Um, and certainly a lot of news coming soon um, over the next few months after we're listed, the development of, of, uh, of the pilot plant. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that in particular. Thanks, Chris. Uh, um, the uh, one thing I would like to point out is, is in simple terms, basically the Aduro system can take unsorted plastic and turn it into energy uh, at, at, a, at a very profitable rate. The other, the other aspect that wasn't mentioned uh, was that the system can handle rubber tires as well. Um, and certainly everybody's heard about the mountains of rubber tires that are, that are hanging around. Um, and, uh, and for Aduro and Dimension 5 to be able to convert those uh, into energy uh, at a profit is, is a pretty big deal. Uh, so Zim2 owns um, 6.2 million shares of, uh, of uh, Dimension 5, uh, and, uh, and we certainly hope that uh, and believe that uh, that is going to produce a tidy profit for Zim2 at some point. Next company is uh, is uh, got an interesting story, and uh, and they have been uh, um, uh, in the news of late. Uh, and uh, maybe I could just introduce uh, David Gower uh, if you could unmute yourself and. Tell us your story. Uh, hi, and thank you very much, and, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, Amarita Resources, I, I guess we're, we're really at a reset position here. Uh, it's been a, a fairly long struggle for us. Uh, he locked up. He locked. It looks like he's paused. Does you know? Uh, David, can you hear us? 
monitoring, uh, highly productive. Uh, a number of major producers in the area, including the closest to us would be Lundin, uh, which is at, uh, has the Nevis Corvo deposit in, in Portugal. We're on the Portugal border. Uh, First Quantum, of course, is there, and Trafigura has the Agos Tenidas mine. Uh, Rio Tinto has a smelter, and Glencore has a zinc smelter in, in, in the country. Uh, we, earlier in the year, were awarded at the Supreme Court of Spain level this project uh, after a five-year uh, court challenge. And there's no grounds for appeal at this stage. And, and now the government, uh, which is a new government also and supportive of the project, has, has issued the license to us. So we're in the process right now of permitting the drill program, which should be done in the next uh, two to three weeks. It's a little bit slower with COVID, but uh, everything is going well and we should start to drill. On this property, there are two deposits. Both of them come to surface. They're only drilled to shallow depths. Uh, the first one known as Infanta, we released uh, 41 historical drill holes uh, a few days ago. Very high grade, which is why it was worth the fight. Uh, you know, the best, some of the better intersections, six meters of 4% copper, 11% lead, 17% zinc, 115 grams per ton silver. Uh, so it's, it's a co copper zinc rich system with, with good uh, precious metal values. We Looks like he froze again, should just come back in a moment. Yeah. The other deposit is much larger on, on the project. It's called Romanera. It's about a 34 million ton deposit that also comes to surface. We're focused on about 11 million tons uh, of higher grade. Uh, we, we don't see these as open pit because it would be very high strip ratios and, and are focused on, on higher grade ramp accessible type operations. Again, we have about 45 drill holes in, in Infanta, Romanero, we have about 50 drill holes already. That was drilled by uh, Rio Tinto in the late 80s, early 90s. Infanta by Phelps Dodge in, in the 70s. Uh, and Romanera, earlier drilling did not even assay for gold. We have zones in there running five grams of gold, which are not even composited into the historical resources. So it's a very exciting uh, proposition. We'll be drilling off essentially two deposits. We're at a 25 million market cap uh, right now. Um, we, we can easily see ourselves if we look at peers such as Adventist Sink or Cisco Metals uh, moving much higher as we start our own drill program. And then the blue sky behind the company is, is there is another deposit, the Asno Coyer project, which is also tied up in, in, a, in a dispute. But the last uh, ruling in that dispute was five judges in, in, in unanimous, unanimously in favor our, of our uh, case. That's a deposit that was already in, in production. It's drilled off as a reserve. It's about 20 to 25 million tons uh, already of 10% combined lead zinc on a property that already has two open pits and, and has been in production in the past. So every, everything is kind of lining up at this point for the company and uh, with the new government, we, we see good support for what we're doing and expect to, uh, to be drilling very soon uh, and, and delivering more results to the market. So that's, that's where we are. Thanks very much, David. Uh, uh, certainly uh, you've been through the wars and come out the other side. Uh, that's got to be exciting for you, for the company, and for your shareholders. Uh, um, so continued good luck. Uh, Zim2 Old owns uh, 1.4 million shares of uh, Amaretta and uh, 357,000 uh, warrants with an exercise price of 15 cents. Um, Next uh, uh, on the agenda, we have uh, we have an email uh, question or a chat question from Thomas, and the question is: uh, a Re floor spar, what share of the floor spar demand is for steel making? Uh, and James, uh, Chris, or Mike, uh, any one of you could try and answer that. 
Are you there, James? Chris, do you want to take Generic a go at that question? question? Sorry? Do you want to take a crack at that question? Um, I would like to uh, come back to that question because I'm not, um, fluorospar is a, it has so many uses and fluorite, uh, how much goes into steel, how much goes into aluminum smelting. I'm not really sure of the percentage. Um, and then of course, you know, the most caustic and the most expensive acid is hydrofluoric acid and acid grade fluorospar is the uh, input feedstock for that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I, I had hoped that James would have uh, fielded this question. Um, I'd be happy to get back to you on that, Thomas, and I apologize for not knowing it off the top of my head. In the case of commerce, of course, fluorospar is our byproduct, and uh, there is a good report out there right now on the fluorospar market, but it's like $8,000, and, and uh, being a little bit Scottish or being um, something, uh, we haven't yet bought it, uh, but we are thinking of it. That may give us more, uh, a, a better answer to your question. All right, uh, we have uh, another question um, from uh, Sebastian. Uh, if you could just unmute yourself and ask your question, we'd be happy to take your question now. Hey, uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? You bet. Yeah. Hey, great, great. Hey, I, as, a, as an investor in Zinc 8 and a big fan uh, of the company, Ron, I, I was hoping to ask you a, a little bit about your strategy for going to market. Uh, specifically, uh, this is a somewhat self-interested question. Uh, I live here in Colorado, and uh, our local utility uh, had a conference call recently where uh, they went to the community and said it is their intention to shut down uh, the local coal-fired power plant as soon as possible, and they are exploring uh, means for uh, energy storage for uh, wind and solar projects that they're going to be deploying shortly. I, on the call, was actually able to ask them if they had explored zinc air batteries, uh, and it was pretty clear that the CEO of Colorado Springs Utilities was unaware of what I was talking about. And uh, my thought was, in terms of a go-to-market strategy, do you see uh, it as being useful having uh, zealots, advocates, evangelists for your technology like myself uh, talking to my local utilities and talking to utility companies generally and finding interested parties? Will that be helpful to you in, in terms of going to market to have somebody who's an investor in the company saying, Yes, you should be looking at this technology, uh, local electrical co-ops and utility providers. What, what's your thought on going to market that way? And is, is what I'm doing useful to you guys, I guess? All right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ron is no longer on that call. Oh. But I'm a, I'm a director of Zinc8. Uh, and certainly um, many of the decisions that are made uh, 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 I have a fair amount of influence and knowledge of what's going on. Sebastian, it's absolutely the best thing when, when people hear from people like yourself uh, that, that there's this new technology, the zinc air battery, um, uh, to get that into the right ears is extremely valuable to the company. Um, we are very serious about forming partnerships with, uh, with transmission companies, uh, uh, producers of electricity. Um, certainly the most uh, significant thing that happened for Zinc 8 was to do that deal with the New York Power Authority. And, uh, and I think I told this story on the Zinc 8 call. But uh, after that news uh, went out about the New York Power Authority, I was driving to work and, uh, and I got a call from Ron McDonald. And he, and he started telling me about this call he got from, uh, from one of the global companies uh, and basically said, uh, uh, if the New York Power Authority is involved, we want to be part of that deal. 
couple of weeks later, again, I'm driving to work, which I do most mornings, um, and uh, I get a call from Ron. And Ron starts telling me this story about how this global company uh, got a hold of them um, um, and uh, basically said, uh, if the New York Power Authority is, is, uh, is on board with you guys, we want to be part of the deal. I said, Ron, you already told me this story. He said, no, Dave, this is the second big company that's approached us solely because of the New York Power Authority deal. So Sebastian, whatever you can do to encourage uh, uh, information um, uh, about Zinc 8 into the right ears, it would be greatly appreciated. Well, I won't take any more of everybody else's time, but I thank you for taking the question and, and I can email you offline about my experiences with trying to do that and, and, and see what your thoughts are. And I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now, but I thank you very much for taking the question. No problem. All right. Um, um, what? There's one more question for Stephanie. You want to take that one through the other? Stephanie's for you. So, somebody's asked a question in German, um, and we're in the process of passing that on to Stefan so that we can find out even what it says, let alone how to answer it. Um, but for, we will deal with that. And. Uh, um, but we'll move on, on the, in the agenda um, to civil resources. Uh, and they also have uh, uh, floor spar interests, uh, although they're more niobium and maybe tantalum, um, but their floor spar is fairly significant as well. Uh, and they're also a joint venture partner with, uh, with commerce resources. Mike? As Dave mentioned, uh, we put out some news today with our uh, option partner, uh, Commerce Resources, uh, on uh, the fluorite sampling that we did uh, from our 2019 drill program. Uh, the results are very good as a byproduct. We wouldn't be moving as a floors bar primary, but uh, we've got the niobium, which uh, we have world-class uh, results on, comes with tantalum um, as well as the floors bar. Uh, Chris uh, and James mostly have gone over the floors bar uh, industry, so I'm not going to touch on that. Uh, what I would like to bring up is for our next drill program, we're looking at uh, two different options. Uh, we, we could go in with the uh, safer drilling and go on the Mallard, which is what we drilled in 2019, uh, where I believe we could put together uh, an inferred resource with relative ease and uh, possibly attract uh, of majors such as CBMM out of Brazil, uh, the largest producer of niobium on the planet. Um, there's also a, a very exciting target that has never been drilled tested called Marana, uh, which is where myself and uh, our project geologist Darren Smith believe uh, there is a significantly higher zone of niobium that is going to come with these kickers as well. Um, I, I would be grateful to have any of your guys' feedback either on this call by email or phone me afterwards on uh, what you would like to see uh, our next step for our drill program in the near future is going to be. So thanks Mike. Uh, uh, Zim2 owns uh, 7.3 million shares of, uh, of, uh, of Seville. Um, uh, we have an additional two million warrants at an exercise price of 10 cents. So let's get the market up there. Can you guys? You need to make me some money. So just get in the market and buy up all our deals. Dave? Uh, yes. Um, could I jump in just for a second? Certainly. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, one of the points I wanted to make for those who are not as familiar with these industrial commodities, I mean, everyone is very familiar with the shiny gold stuff called gold. Uh, but in terms of most of the commodities you've heard about today, rare earth elements, fluorospar, and niobium, these are industrial commodities. There are real supply demand specifics that make all of these companies working on these projects uh, huge opportunities. And we understand these markets extremely well. One of the things that uh, is also happening right now is that, uh, for example, in China, uh, at this time of uh, COVID, uh, in the last quarter, the amount of infrastructure building by the Chinese government, basically think about it as political security via creating jobs for Chinese citizens, that has been one of the most active uh, quarters of all time. And to build infrastructure, you need steel. To build the steel, you need fluorospar. And then you also need niobium for the steel. And so these are uh, uh, rare earth elements, niobium, fluorospar, these are all essential commodities that are all seeing a uh, greater demand than supply right now. That's it. Thanks, Chris. If I could speak, uh, say something to what, what Chris just said there, just this morning, there were very prominent reports about reports out of China that the degree of hoarding, commodities hoarding, is stratospheric. Now, on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the articles that I was reading, the main fear from it was that the, the, the writers feared fear that this was a portent for war, which is obviously, you know, this is a common narrative. The point was, was that they were behaving very, very differently and they are holding back everything. It hasn't quite, that, that, that wave hasn't quite hit yet. But this has been, as Chris said, this has been a trend for a while and it seems to be now becoming extreme. And ultimately, my personal little you know, pet theory, being South African, is that the West is completely unaware of the degree of leverage that the Chinese have in Africa. The, Ch the African states are up to their eyeballs in debt, and the resources are the collateral. This is the whole issue with all of these African projects. Tantalum, we don't talk much about tantalum with commerce, because that's our other project, but that bullet will hit. And it goes across the board, and I think that people are starting to be aware that there's going to be a big wake-up moment that, that comes soon. End of speech. The uh, point. The uh, um, uh, before uh, China goes to war here, uh, we've got some business to do, and uh, that is the business of answering any questions that that anybody has. Um, and. Uh, Stefan, did you get the one in German? Yes, I, I received a couple of questions from Helmut. He's in, in, in holiday right now in Italy. Well, uh, basically, he's, he's a shareholder of Zimtu since the very early days, since Commerce and Western Potash. And uh, back then, you always published new data on your shareholdings, and he's kind of missing that right now. And he's looking for more transparency of your holdings and more regular publications of these holdings and he's asking if you are uh, if you are going to change that you can tell him that we will certainly consider his suggestion uh, uh, again um, and uh, um, um, I think he can look forward to uh, uh, more disclosure on what our actual holdings are. Um, as I've been disclosing on these uh, eight companies uh, all the way along here. Um, you know, there are some uh, issues, uh, some companies were an insider of, some companies were not an insider of, uh, but we will address that. Any, anything else, Stefan? Well, he's just saying that the same for the website as well, that you should update the Zim2 website more often with your uh, holdings. He thinks it's back from 2017. 
and uh, he's like, uh, he rather prefers to see all the information on the website instead of Twitter or Facebook. And also when receiving emails to reply a little bit faster. And uh, yeah, and Dennis also asked the question that um, where are the catalysts for the Zim2 stock price in the next couple of months to, to rise? Right now we're standing at 14 Canadian cents and He's asking, where do you see Zimtu's share price at the end of the year? Or what are you doing to increase the share value even more? Well, certainly uh, uh, one of the keys to, uh, to uh, a rising share price of Zimtu would be uh, overall uh, uh, success, uh, market success, uh, where uh, our holdings are increasing in value. Uh, or all of our holdings. Uh, the basic theory that uh, the tide raises all boats. Um, that certainly is one uh, uh, possibility that could have a dramatic effect on Zim2. And the other is we have significant shareholdings in, um, in some pretty unique opportunities. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Dimension 5 deal uh, certainly has capabilities uh, uh, of doing extremely well over the next uh, uh, 8 to 12 months. Um, um, the uh, Commerce Resources uh, Seville team, um, that, uh, that, that combination uh, of rare earths and niobium and, uh, and fluoride um, certainly could, uh, uh, with, uh, the, with the deal with the right uh, major, certainly could uh, uh, spiral uh, uh, Zim2's uh, share value considerably. Um, the, uh, the Zinc 8 uh, uh, possibility, um, somewhat independent of, uh, of the mining sector, um, um, it, uh, it has global ramifications. Essentially, Zinc 8 can save the world's electrical infrastructure. With the demand for electricity uh, to power electric vehicles uh, is going to create quite a, such a load on the electrical system the transportation of electricity, that the zinc air battery is going to become critical globally. So, you know, I think that we're involved in, in quite a variety of companies. Um, um, you know, David Gower is a, a company that he spoke of earlier, even though we have a smaller share position, certainly that kind of company is very capable of, of doing the, the multi-dollars. Uh, uh, Aries, the floor spar uh, producer. We've got some really exciting deals that I believe are going to be able to drive the, the Zim2 market. Uh, I mean, right at the moment, if you take the breakup value of, of all of the shares we own, um, and divided by the outstanding shares in, in Zim2, you get a book value of 50, 60 cents and a trading value of 14. So I would like to point out that that low trading value is, is not my fault, it's your fault. You need to buy more stock. It's just that simple. Anyways, uh, uh, having said that, do we... Uh, do we uh, have any other questions? Well, that's about it. I mean, he's, Helmut is also suggesting that you do more uh, communications, more marketing for the Zim2 company itself, instead of so much focusing on the uh, individual companies, but also doing more for Zim2 in terms of communications, presentations, and uh, yeah, and he, he's really looking forward to a higher share price, especially when the holdings are doing much better in the near term future. Mention to him that we hired Colton away from the provincial government. Uh, he, he's our secret weapon in the digital world. What do you think about that, Colton?
That's right. We're going to be posting a lot more, hopefully updating the website as much as we can as well. Anybody else? Dave, I have a question. Um, oh, good. Ron left, so um, you could answer it because it's about Zinc 8. Um, Zinc 8 is operating very much with utilities. And by the way, I come from New York, so I certainly know about what's been happening here. And it's, and it's great. The question is, are you looking at local, standalone systems for households? And are you considering working with Tesla, or let me backtrack, Elon Musk, because he does solar and he is also very interested in local? All right, first of all, we do have a deal with a, uh, a, uh, a car dealer uh, out of Surrey who is building a, um, a, a new house, a uh, giant house, uh, you know, the five car garage that, uh, uh, that will be completely off the grid, powered by solar and wind, uh, and supported by a zinc air battery uh, for that consistency uh, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Um, that project is uh, is a is a demonstration project. Uh, the house is under construction. We're underway, and we'll supply a battery uh, to what is a fairly high-profile individual home. Um, it certainly is going to get the 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 write-ups in the home magazines because it's it's got a number of very unique features. So that's on a fairly small basis. In terms of, uh, of, of dealing with utilities, um, that is really where Zinc 8 has its true st strength um, because it's the only battery that can, that can economically level the grid. In terms of Tesla um, and uh, and their battery day that's coming up on the 22nd, essentially the, the demand that the electric car is going to put on the, on the electrical system basically means Elon Musk cannot be successful without Zinc 8. Without Dave Hodge's help, there is no Elon Musk. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pass that on. <laughs> Pass that on to Elon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Where is Sebastian? Why don't you phone Elon Musk for us? <laughs> Does that mean Zinc 8 stock is going to go over a thousand shortly? <laughs> yeah, take that to the bank. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, what would we do without you <laughs> and your New York accent? <laughs> it's actually a Bronx accent out of New York. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Child of the Bronx. Yes, of the Bronx. Uh, well, all right, folks. This has been a, a very en enlightening meeting for me in any event. I hope you found it interesting. Um, we will get an email out to you shortly uh, with uh, a little more due diligence information on the eight companies that presented. Um, um, when you do, do that, make sure you... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, make, make sure you, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Somebody just asked a very funny question. Um, I think we must be German because the question says, uh, uh, I do have a question about zinc. And, uh, and, 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 and then he wrote zinc. Um, um, but uh, it's just uh, us uh, uh, Canucks laughing at our German friends. Uh, uh, accents when they speak English. Um, anyway, uh, 
Yes, could you, who is that? Tamir. Tamir. Tamir, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out uh, about the, I can see that the stock is down in the last couple of days. And I wonder how do you guys supporting the, the stock? I mean, what, what, what things I'm going to see in the next 10 days? All right, uh, uh, Zincate has been busy uh, closing the, uh, the oversubscribed financing, which you might think is easy, but uh, you know, when, when people want to buy stock and you have to phone them and tell them no, it is, uh, uh, it's quite upsetting uh, for both the person that's getting the no and the person that's delivering the no because what we do is the opposite. We phone people and tell them to give us their money, uh, uh, not say no. So um, that has been sort of consuming the attention of the Zinc 8 people. Uh, including the, you know, fighting over who's going to be left on the list, who's going to be left standing. Um, um, to that, to that, we have uh, negotiated a, a deal with a marketing firm uh, that uh, they actually wrote us a check for over six hundred thousand dollars, and so I, you know, I'm quite confident that they're going to get started here in the next few days. We do have a series of news releases that uh, um, have been uh, tied up a little bit uh, by COVID, uh, but those news releases should start coming out uh, 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 next week. Uh, we'll, we'll start that off. Um, so I'm confident that Zinc 8 is going to do well. Um, I um, hope that answered your question. How, uh, another question, uh, how are you guys supporting the market now? Um, by word of mouth, um, you know, we have, uh, we have a couple of mouthpieces on, uh, on the payroll. Um, that have been basically um, um, encouraging the people they know or their book, so to speak, into, into buying the stock. Uh, I'm pretty confident that they have been doing a, a pretty good job of that uh, because I can see the buying coming in and where it's coming from. Um, but um, Zincade is going to do very well in the long term. Um, you know, uh, um, I'm more focused on making sure that Zinc 8 has money to move forward than I am about the, the share price today because it's really the share price tomorrow that we need to be paying attention to and that's where the opportunity is. And I, I think uh, that, uh, Tamara, you're, you're, as a shareholder, I think you're going to do well as long as you can just hang in there. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I believe that Telsa has uh, September 22nd, the battery day. Do you think it's going to, uh, to make any impact? Zinc 8 will be taking steps to try and, uh, and take advantage of those, uh, of those opportunities that are going to be created by what we believe is Tesla is going to announce that essentially they're moving from a car company to a battery company and their new developments of their battery um, they're going to end up supplying their their battery to all of the major car manufacturers Tesla will be the leader in the battery industry um, um, as much as they will continue on with their car business. Um, but it's the, it's the battery technology that they have been developing is where the real upside is. 
And to that extent, it's going to, it's going to drive that whole electric car industry even faster, which is going to put the pressure on the electrical grids globally um, that their only savior is the same guy who's going to save the turtles. It's the Zinc 8, 8 battery um, is essentially going to mean that we don't have to replace the whole grid because we'll be able to maximize its use 24 hours a day through the zinc air battery and its ability to store energy cheaply. Yes. Any other questions? Well, folks, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I do thank you for coming. Um, and we'll certainly make sure you get an invite to the next Zoom with Zoom 2 uh, presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, this is our attempt to, to keep the industry going uh, through COVID. It's our form of, of showing open communication with, uh, with our shareholders and the shareholders of, uh, of the companies we're following. Um, we'll continue to develop our Zoom with Zoom 2 capabilities um, and uh, look forward to seeing you and your friends. Don't forget to bring your friends next time. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you and your friends on a screen near you shortly. <laughs>